Okay, if we're talking parametric surfaces, uh, the goal is to find the parametric equations of a surface and to calculate surface area. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to have a surface in this section. Uh, you might draw the surface, or it, you know, it might look like some kind of hill in space. So imagine, if you will, a surface. Um, and we call that surface S. And I put the little tails in the ends of the S curl to make it look like a capital S as opposed to a lowercase s, right? Um, okay, so let's describe what a vector valued function of two variables looks like. Because if you, okay, remember we talked in chapter, oh, the first chapter about a vector valued function of one variable, r of t, right? And it could have three components, um, x of t, y of t, z of t. What kind of object, uh, whoops, what kind of object does this describe? x of t, y of t, z of t. What kind of object can this describe? It has basically a single input variable, t, right? That's the parameter. And back in chapter 12, it described a curve, right? Now when we have two inputs for each coordinate function, two inputs instead of one will have two, it should at least intuitively seem reasonable that it should describe a surface in space. Okay, so our vector valued function of a surface like this S in space is going to be given by, we'll use the inputs U and V, R of UV, equals, okay, I'm going to use IJK form, so uh, the first component would be X of UV, so instead of X of T, X of UV, I, plus Y of UV, J, plus Z of UV, K. Okay, so there's your parametric representation of a surface. The, um, and that's a, in, the, in the form of a vector valued function. That's what we're describing here. Now the actual parametric equations of the surface can be obtained by setting x equal to the i component of R of UV, uh, y equal to the j component, and z equal to the k component. And so you're your parametric equations are x equals x of uv, y equals y of uv, z equals z of uv. It's just another way to represent the surface in terms of parametric equations as opposed to a vector valued function. Um, and u and v are called the parameters, just like for a curve, t was called the parameter. So what do you need to know how to do? Well, you need to know how to parameterize a surface. So in this example, let's parameterize the upper hemisphere of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. What, what, is, what does x squared plus y squared plus z squared graph to be? It's a special sphere, right? It's the unit sphere, isn't it? The unit sphere is centered where? At the origin and has, of course, uh, radius equal to 1. So uh, we, want, we want to parameterize the upper half of that sphere. And I'll tell you uh, what, a trick, anytime you can represent a function, z equals f of x, y, anytime you can represent a surface as a function with two inputs like that, it's super easy to parameterize. Because you can let, this is generic here, you can let, um, you can let x equal u, you can let y equal v, and then z is equal to, well, f of uv. Just replace x and y with u and v. And those are your parametric equations. And if you want to turn it into a vector valued function, then r of uv is simply ui plus vj plus um, f of uv times k. So this is kind of what you do. It, it works the same way every time. If you can express S, so this guy 
expresses s as a function of two variables, x and y, okay? It's just like when you can express y as a function of x, you just let x equal t, and then you automatically get your, your uh, parametric equations or your vector value to, uh, functions in terms of, of t. You let x equal t, and then, then y is automatically equal to f of t. Same, same idea. So in this partic particular case, if we can represent the hemisphere, um, that surface as z in terms of some equation, we're in. We can use this format and come up with our parameterization. So, um, well, is it easy enough to, s to, to get z by itself here and get the upper half of the sphere? So this equation describes a happy little sphere. Here's your happy little sphere. But we only want the upper hemisphere. So if we erase this bottom part, we're interested in a parameterization of that, right? And what, what about this equation of the, this is the equation of the entire sphere. What about that describes the upper hemisphere? What part, uh, what could you do to this equation to describe the upper hemisphere? Sol solve for z, right? And if you solve for z, you end up taking a square root. But to get the upper hemisphere, you would take the positive square root, right? So subtract x squared and y squared from both sides and take the square root to get rid of the, the exponent on the z. Take the positive square root and guess what? This describes that upper hemisphere. Make sense? Okay, so then uh, it's almost an afterthought to turn this into a, a parametric equations. The parametric equations would be um, x equals, uh, say, u. Um, y equals v, and then automatically z is equal to what? The square root of 1 minus u squared minus v squared. So these are your parametric equations of that hemisphere. Now what if you want to describe it as a vector valued function, r of uv? Then you could write it as what? Ui, whoops. Plus vj plus the square root of 1 minus u squared minus v squared times k. So we won't have to deal with this too often, but it's worth seeing once. What if we wanted to parameterize the full sphere, which is not a function, right? It wouldn't pass a vertical line test in space, would it? Can't be a function if it doesn't pass the vertical line test in space. So a sphere of radius A, what's the equation, what's the, the Cartesian equation of a sphere of radius A? X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals A squared, assuming we put the center at the origin, right? Which is a good thing to do, otherwise it just gets more complicated. Okay, do you guys see why that last technique won't work? If we solve for z and we want both the upper hemisphere and the lower hemisphere, which create this sphere, then uh, you need both the positive and negative square roots if you solve for z. And you could do it with two separate parameterizations, I suppose, but not one. So we need to use a different technique. And what we do is we take uh, a hint from spherical coordinates where uh, we let rho equal um, a, the, the constant radius of the sphere, okay? So here's the trick uh, for parameterizing a sphere. We need, uh, we're gonna take, instead of using u and v, let's take our parameters to be um, phi and theta, okay? And then I'm going to let x, so I'm coming up with my parametric equation for x. Okay, think about it in, now, now I'm not converting, don't, don't get the wrong idea, I'm not converting to spherical coordinates here, but I'm using spherical coordinates as a guide as to how to define my x in terms of, of phi, my parameters phi and theta, okay? So in spherical coordinates, x is rho, sine, phi, cosine theta. Remember that? Okay, so um, 
rho is constant here. So A times sine phi, that's like the rho, but it's constant, whereas in spherical coordinates, rho is not necessarily constant. Sine phi cosine theta. That's what I'm going to let x equal. And based on that, what do you think I'm going to let? You may not understand why I'm doing this yet or why it's going to work, but what, uh, what am I going to let y equal? A sine phi sine theta. And then do you remember what z is? In spherical coordinates, it's rho. In general, in general, it's rho cosine phi, but here it'll be A cosine phi. And then what do you suppose will make, we, we can limit the values of phi and theta, although we don't have to, we can. We can let phi range from, to carve out the entire sphere, we can let phi range from zero to just pi, remember, and theta ranges from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so these are your parametric equations up here. Now, I need to make sure you understand why this works. So these are your parametric equations. I'll just prove to you that it works. Look, if you plug in x in terms of phi and theta and y in terms of phi and theta and z in terms of uh, phi into the equation of your sphere, since these represent points on the sphere, these, these parametric equations represent points on the sphere, right? They should satisfy the equation. And that'll at least be a convincing argument as to why this parameterization works. So let's do it. Let's plug in x, y, and z into our equation and see if we get a true statement. This is just like checking uh, a solution to an equation, right? If you have a single solution and you want to check to make sure it works, you plug it back in and make sure you get a true statement, right? Well, here we have an infinite number of solutions described by phi and theta. When you, you plug in a different value of phi and theta, you get different values of x, y, and z. But uh, they should, they all should lie on the sphere, so they all should satisfy the equation of the sphere. Okay, so let's plug it in. So I'm going to plug in a sine phi cosine theta in for x. So that gives me, what does that give me? Uh, so here's my check. Um, that gives me a uh, sine phi cosine theta, the whole thing squared. That's my x squared. Plus, plugging in y, I get a sine phi sine theta, the whole thing squared. That's my y squared. And then a cosine phi, the whole thing squared, that's my z squared. What had that better equal? It better equal a squared for these points to lie on, on the sphere. Okay, so let's see. Does it equal a squared? Well, let's just evaluate. Okay, when you take a product and square it, that, that exponent applies to each factor in the product. So it's a squared, sine squared phi, cosine squared theta plus a squared, sine squared phi, sine squared theta, plus a squared, cosine squared phi. You see some identities coming at you? What could I, uh, okay, I want you to focus on the first two terms. Is there a common factor that I could take out? Okay, if I, if I take out a squared sine squared phi from the first two terms, what's left? C cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which is a fancy way of saying what? One. So I end up with uh, th this guy is just one, and so I end up with the a squared sine squared phi plus a squared cosine squared phi, but do you see right away that if you factor out a squared again, you get a squared times one. You get a squared times sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi, which is a squared times one, or just a squared. Check. Okay, so these, these parametric equations describe the sphere. Okay, they graph to be on the sphere at the very least. Uh, really, they graph to be the entire sphere. Okay, the next example, let's see if we can parameterize 4x squared plus y squared equals 16. Can you guys tell me what this 
object, what this surface is in space. It's a cylinder. Z is missing, right? Anything in the, so you know it's a cylinder. What kind of cylinder? It's an elliptic cylinder, right? Because in the plane, the, this would be the generating curve. Uh, in the xy plane, 4x squared plus y squared equals 16 would be the generating curve. Um, and of course, that 4x squared plus uh, y squared plus 16 graphs to be an ellipse. So it'd be an elliptic cylinder when you translate that generating curve up and down parallel to the z-axis. Okay, um, so what's the trick for parameterizing an ellipse? This is something you've seen before. First of all, it would be best to rewrite the equation of the ellipse in standard form. So how do I do that? Divide by 16. So if I, if I divide by 16 and arrange it, it properly, let's say I get x squared over 4 sixteenths or x squared over 4, which is the same as x over 2, the whole thing squared. Pl uh, plus y squared over 16, which is the same as y over 4, the whole thing squared, equals 1. Do you guys buy that? So divide everything by 16 and, and arrange, do a little algebra on it, and you get that. So think, okay, cosine squared, think of this identity. Cosine squared, uh, t, I'll use t. Cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. So this is the identity we're going to make use of here. Let's parameterize just the ellipse, just, just the curve, using u as our parameter, okay? So uh, what would x over 2 have to equal to make use of this equation? Or it doesn't have to equal this, but usually that's what we do. Yeah, you could set x over 2 equal to the cosine, let's use u, cosine u. And let's set y over 4 equal to sine u. And that parameterizes the generating curve for the cylinder 4x squared plus y squared equals 16 in space. I if you solve for x and y, that is. So you get x equals 2 cosine u, y equals 4 sine u. And then you're going to let u run from 0 to 2 pi to carve out the generating curve. But that's only in the plane. How do we get, how, how do we get it to translate into a surface, an elliptic cylinder in space. Well, we've got to put in another parametric equation, z, right? So what would z equal? Well, you don't want to call it u. It's got to be a different variable. Call it just v. OK, so this is important. This is where u only has to go from 0 to 2 pi. It could go further, but then it would carve out the generating curve, you know, more than once. So you don't need to do that. And then V ranges to carve out the entire cylinder, which goes down forever and up forever. Think of an infinitely long can of Coke. Uh, you'd have to let V, which corresponds to the height, be all real numbers. V is any real number. Okay, so these are your parametric equations. In this definition, S is given by um, R of uv, which has component functions x of uv, y of uv, and z of uv. We're going to want to find derivatives of these things. And we can take, well, you know how to take the derivative of R of t, right? We take the derivative with respect to t component by component, right? That's from the second chapter. Well, we can take the derivatives with respect to u component by component and the derivative with respect to v component by component. So we're going to define partial derivatives here of the vector valued function. So the partial derivatives, well, the derivative of r of u v with respect to u then, using, say, Leibniz notation would be the derivative, okay, component by component, I'm just going to take the derivative. The derivative of x with respect to u, so I'm using the funky d partial derivative notation times i, plus the derivative of y with respect to u, it's a partial derivative notation, j, plus the derivative of z with respect to u, k. And that would be the partial derivative of the vector valued function r with respect to u. And we're just extending, it shouldn't seem 
a big shock to you. We're just extending the idea of partial derivatives to parametric um, vector valued functions. And then what you guys tell me, what would the derivative of r with respect to v be? All, all of these would be the same except for what would you change? Instead of u down here with respect to u, it'd be with respect to v. These are your partial derivatives of r. A few notes on these partial derivatives. Uh, both the derivative of r with respect to u at some point, u naught, v naught, and, the and r with respect to v at that point are tangent vectors to s. If you put their tails at r of u naught, v naught, they'll both be tangent to s. That should not come as a surprise based on what we've talked about. So if, if I were to attempt to draw this, I don't know if I should, but if I were to attempt to draw some surface in space, we'll call this surface S, and suppose for the, uh, let me put in uh, maybe a, a cross-sectional curve here and here. Suppose that at this point we have, so at this point, that is R of U naught V naught. Suppose the derivative of R with respect to U um, that's a vector, right? If you put the tail of it, say, here at r of u naught v naught, it's going to be tangent to the surface. So that so that vector in green might represent the derivative of r w with respect to u at u naught v naught. Um, and yeah, it it be, because this curve, this this curve in black here, then could be the curve that you get when you hold v naught constant and allow u to vary, right? So at, at u naught v naught, you would expect the derivative of r with respect to u to be tangent to that curve. And then likewise, the derivative of r with respect to v at that same point might be tangent to the um, cross-sectional curve that you get when you hold, say, u constant, which might be represented by that curve in black. And it, if you put its tail at r of u naught v naught, it will also be tangent to that curve. And so they'll both, r, r sub v, r sub u, at both at u naught v naught, will be tangent to the surface. And as long as their cross product is not equal to the zero vector, in other words, as long as the cross product of this guy and this guy doesn't equal zero, then S is going to have a tangent plane that contains these two tangent vectors at R of u naught v naught. Why? Well, it goes back to something way from the very first chapter. If, if the cross product equals zero, then the two vectors are scalar multiples. And so then, this, in this picture, these two vectors would degrade into a single vector. And you couldn't guarantee that there's a tangent plane there. But when they're different vectors and not scalar multiples of each other, then you could, hopefully it's clear, you could find a tangent plane that, or a plane, which would be the tangent plane that contains both vectors. In, in note number three, um, we have a name for it if that cross product of, of the partials with respect to u and v is non-zero for all u and v in the domain of d, uh, where, where t would be the domain of r u v, that is. We call s the surface smooth because that means it's going to have a tangent plane everywhere on its domain. And in order to have a tangent plane everywhere on its domain, it's got to be a pretty well-behaved function, not have any creases in it or points. Um, and so it's going to be a nice, smooth surface. Think of a snapshot of a flag blowing in the wind and a nice breeze. If you just took a picture of that, it would be nice and it, it would have some ripples in it, but it would be nice and smooth and you could put a flat tangent plane anywhere on that, on that picture of that flag. Okay, note number four. As long as S is smooth, so just think very well behaved surface. No, no creases. It's going to have a tangent plane everywhere. Then R of UV Remember, R of u, v represents s. 
map small rectangles in D. So think of D as the domain of R of UV, and it contains the UV points that you're allowed to plug in to the vector valued function R of UV that represents S, that maps to BS. So um, as long as S is smooth, R of UV maps small rectangles in D to small parallelogram-ish, they're not really parallelograms, they're parallelograms with curved sides, so they're not really parallelograms, but they look like parallelograms on the surface of S. So, for instance, perhaps, um, perhaps this um, rectangle here, well, it's almost a rectangle, here maps to this almost parallelogram here under R of UV. So maps like that. And we've actually seen this idea before. Do you remember when we were finding the area element for the change of variables? We were mapping a region S in the UV plane to a region R in the XY plane. So it was a flat patch of surface in the XY plane that we were mapping to. Now we're mapping to, it's a not quite flat surface in the, in the micro um, in space. But it's kind of the same idea. In, in 15.9, R of UV was our transformation, right? Here we're thinking of R of UV as mapping to a surface in space. In 15.9, it mapped to a surface in the plane. So it just had, it just had X of UV and Y of UV as coordinates and not the, Z, not the Z of UV as the third coordinate. But the same idea holds and we can use the results from 15.9 to get the area of this small patch of surface on S. So um, we get A of S, which stands for the area of our surface S, as the uh, double integral of the magnitude of RU cross RVDA. So this, this piece right here, you guys, the magnitude of RU cross RV, would be our surface area element. Surface area element. Okay? And then if you, so go back to this picture. That little piece would represent the area of this patch of surface right there. Okay? So that's the magnitude of RU cross R, approximately anyway. RU cross RV DA. And then imagine summing up all such surface patches, taking a limit, creating a Riemann sum. You'd get this double integral assuming it exists. So this is your area of the surface. This is your surface area formula. If Z equals F of XY, then the surface S is given by, okay, what would be the parametric equation or, or the better yet, the vector valued function version of our surface. Um, if, we, if we keep the parameters, we don't change to U and V. We keep X and Y as our parameters. Then if you want to represent uh, the surface S, as a vector valued function, you could simply do this. So it's going to be R of X, Y equals, um, okay, X, I plus Y, J plus F of X, Y, K. So this is our vector valued function. We're just not using the parameters U and V. We're using just X and Y as parameters. There's no reason why we can't do that. They're just letters. Okay, um, so that's the way we, re we represent um, the surface S as a vector valued function if you can represent the surface in Cartesian form Z equals F of X, Y. Um, okay, and then the question is, what does the magnitude then in this formula up here, what does the magnitude of R, in this case R sub X cross R sub V, R sub Y, excuse me, become? With a little bit of work, not too much work, you can show that it becomes the square root of 1 plus f sub x squared 
plus f sub y squared. In fact, I think, I think we have enough time to show that right now. So if you actually take this product, this cross product, uh, think about how we take a cross product. Um, we're going to take r sub x cross r sub y. Okay, remember across the top goes i, j, k. And then across the middle, the components of the derivative of r with respect to x. What would the derivative of r with respect to x be? Okay, what's the derivative of x with respect to x? It's not a trick question, it's just one. What's the derivative of y with respect to x? No. Zero. What's the derivative of f of x, y with respect to x? f sub x. Derivative of f, with, that's the notation, right? Okay, that's r sub x. That goes in the middle row for the components in the middle row. Okay, take the derivative of r with respect to y. Focus on r of x, y up here. What's the derivative of x with respect to y? Zero. y with respect to y? One. F of x, y with respect to y? F sub y. And if you run through it, if you cross out the first column and take the cross product of the remaining matrix, 0, f sub x, 1, f sub y, um, you will get 0 here and then negative f sub x here. So negative f sub x, i. Cross out middle column. By definition, there's a minus here. Cross out middle column. Take the determinant. You'll get uh, f sub y minus uh, 0, j. Cross out the last column, and you just get plus 1, k. And if you take the magnitude of this, You just square the components, add them together, take the square root. You'll get um, f sub x squared plus f sub y squared plus 1 squared. Or 1 plus f sub x squared plus f sub y squared. OK, so this is this is y. Why is that true? This is the explanation, OK? Yes. For the magnitude part, it's uh, um, cross Oh, it's here. supposed to be a Y right there. I lost my tail on my Y. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So is that clear? Well, that, that makes, if you can remember that, then it makes finding the surface area element easy, or a lot easier. So the surface area element then in this area formula, A of S, becomes the integral over r, so r is going to be the domain of z equals f of x, y, where z equals f of x, y generates our surface s. So you end up getting the double integral of the square root of 1 plus f sub x squared plus f sub y squared dA. So the, in other words, the, this is our surface area element, what it breaks down to. This is what we'll be using in practice to calculate surface area. Okay. By the way, I don't think I wrote it down earlier e either, but the surface area element, we have a name for it. We call the surface area element DS, D capital S, okay? So the DS that we're interested in memorizing is this version right here. DS is your surface area element, okay? And it's got to be capital S because D lowercase s stands for uh, something else, right? It stands for a a little piece of arc length, doesn't it? An infinitesimally small piece of arc length. So um, this is like an infinitesimally small patch of surface area. But the notation, it's, it's, it's neat notation because of the analogy here. Um, but it can be confusing if you don't use ca a capital S there. Okay, to close out this section then, let's, let's, let's find the surface area of f of x, y equals uh, x times y, where r... In other words, the values of x and y that we're allowed to plug in to f of x, y is given um, by the disk. In, inside the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 16. That's the disk. x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 16. Those are the values we're allowed to plug in. 
So if you think about it, if you're only allowed to plug in values that lie in the disk, those uh, are going to go, uh, uh, think of those as being beamed up to the surface, right? And it's going to create an area on the surface that if, since the disk is, is bounded and finite, um, as far, well, it, it's bounded, right? Um, and uh, the function's continuous, you would expect that the related surface area on the graph of the function to be finite as well, okay? And so it should make sense to you that, oh, there is going to be a finite surface area that these points map to given this domain. And that's what we're finding. Does that make sense? So it's like, um, I, you know, I, just generically, if I graphed a function, and again, this picture doesn't necessarily look like x times y, but that's fine. It's like this. If I graphed a function, and here's x, y, z, and I have a closed bounded domain down here in the x, y plane, then when you beam it up, it's going to, you know, beam up this, these points in the x, y plane via the function, then it's going to correspond to a, a, a surface area that, you know, may, it may get bent around a little bit, but it'll correspond to a finite surface area on the function itself. Does that make any sense at all? Z equals f of x, y in pink here gives the function, or gives the surface rather, s. Okay? So that's just to make sure you understand what the heck it is we're doing. What the heck it is we're finding. Okay, so again, this is um, more generic. It's not a picture that's related to x times y. Okay, so uh, we use the formula and we let the formula guide us. The area of that surface, surface area A of S, is equal, equal to the double integral over S. I'm going to write it like this, dS, okay? Because it's instructive to know what these differentials stand for. And dS, you need to know then, in rectangular coordinates, dS is equal to the square root of 1 plus F sub X squared, the derivative of F with respect to X squared, plus F sub Y squared dA, okay? So this, let the formula be the guide. In other words, you don't memorize steps, you memorize the formula and let the formula tell you the steps for finding the area of the surface. And you work the formula from the inside out, just like you evaluate the, an integral from the inside out. Um, inside this function, what do you need to find? What does it tell you to find? What, what, in order to find ds, you need to find the partials of, uh, of f with respect to x and f with respect to y, right? So let the formula be your guide. Okay, well, f of x, y is x times y. So if I want to find the partial with respect to x, what is that? Y. If I want to find the partial with respect to y, what is that? X. x. So if I want to find ds, then... That's going to be the square root of 1 plus what plus what? Y squared plus... Yeah, y, yeah, y squared plus x squared or x squared plus y squared. And then the dA is on the end, right? So the area, the surface area becomes the double integral. Now, once we turn it into an integral with respect to x and y, um, we project down, our surface down, to get the region of integration, which we usually change to R, just by convention. And we know in this particular problem, it's the square root of x squared plus y squared dA. And so that's still pretty generic. In this particular case, we know R is the disk x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 16. So r is the disk, x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 16 in this case. So are we going to, because we're integrating over a disk, are, are we going to mess with Cartesian coordinates anymore? No, we're going to switch to what? Polar. And in fact, we could probably do this without drawing the region of integration course for the final. You should be able to draw 
a disk of radius, what's the radius? Four. Four. Right? It's going to look something like that anyway. Put in a spoke. What does R run from? Zero to four. What's uh, to sweep out the entire disk? What's theta going to run from? Zero to two pi. Okay, and then let's switch to uh, polar coordinates for the integrand. The integrand, which is just part of the square root now, it's square root of one plus x squared plus y squared is r squared, and our differentials then become. Our area element becomes, in polar coordinates, r dr d theta. You got it. Now, to save time, I'm just going to give you, I know you guys can evaluate this on your own. I'm going to give you the answer, and we're going to take a break. The answer is a very pretty 2 pi over 3 times 17 root 17 minus 1. Okay? You could break this up into a product of two integrals if you like, because... The integrand is a function of r only, and the limits of integration are constant.